I'd like to invite Dr. Amelia Enns up to the stage. And Amelia is a cross-cultural ecologist in the Department of Environmental Science at Macquarie. Over the past 10 years, she has worked with Aboriginal rangers and communities in Indigenous protected areas in Arnhem Land, and more recently in northern New South Wales, to, to develop collaborative action research projects. In 2017, Amelia won the um, Eureka Prize for Citizen Science, along with the We Study the Country research team. Amelia was also successful in obtaining one of the recent Australian citizen science grants. Amelia also lectures in environmental um, management at the uni, so please join me in welcoming Amelia. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Amelia Enns. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Nukawa We Study Black Country Research Team, which is a Creole way of saying Nukawa We Study the Country Research Team. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, our Eureka Prize winning project um, and why I guess we won it. First, I want to acknowledge the Ghana people um, and all Indigenous people here in the audience today and all Aboriginal custodians of the land that I work and live on, past, present and future. I also want to pay my respect to all non-Aboriginal people that work with Aboriginal people, um, knowing um, the challenges that we encounter when we're working together and encourage more people um, to work in the cross-cultural context in the future. So, citizen science. As we've heard people discussing already, it's not always about lots of people collecting lots of data. Um, small projects can really empower and change the course of the community and all of our work together, all the little projects that we're doing together as a whole, we can change the world to be a better place. So this is the awesome thing about citizen science, why I'm really enjoying being here. Um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that, that we're all you know, contributing to a really important movement. And it's not always about quantity, but quality matters, I guess, as our project shows. Um, so a bit about the Mukwara We Study Black Country research team. Um, some of the, it, well, it's an innovative sort of project and quite solutions focused. Um, I'll talk to you today about where we work in remote Aboriginal Australia, um, how we've co-developed co the project over 10 years, um, the cross-cultural nature of our work, on the multiple benefits, um, covering local, national, um, multifaceted and multidisciplinary um, fields. We also really work hard to produce tangible outputs in a variety of forms. So through YouTube, uh, through the Atlas of Living Australia, journal articles, conferences, lectures, community talks, you know, going out, having yarns with people wherever we can. So I'm really delighted that we can share our story with you today because it's all part of um, the movement, sharing the work that we're doing. Um, another thing that we do is really work hard to collaborate with other people, um, with external scientists, and we're really fortunate to work with the Atlas of Living Australia. So today I'm going to cover some of these seven key features of our work, starting with um, where we work in remote Aboriginal Australia. So I'd just like a show of hands, who works with Aboriginal people in remote Australia? Anybody here had the, the joy, the experience and the honour? Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, this is where we work in Wukor. It's in southeast Arnhem Land. Uh, it's about six hours drive from Darwin if I'm driving, uh, maybe eight or nine for others. I um, just want to get there, um, get out the bush and just feel the dust in the back of my throat. It's a good thing. Um, yeah, so Gulkwara, it's a small community um, off the beaten track on the western coast of the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, Gulkwara is based on the southern border of the southeast Arnhem Land Indigenous Protected Area. Uh, you can see it in brown here on the map. And the seal IPA is about the same size as Kakadu National Park. It's 20,000 square kilometres. A uh, very remote country and about probably 2,500, 3,000 people living across that 20,000 square kilometres. Um, Mukord, it's a small community, um, about 1,000 people, 95% uh, Aboriginal people. Um, it was the first mission town in Arnhem Land, established in 1908, where around seven of the surrounding clan groups were brought into the community through um, the mission and government kind of um, initiatives. 
for want of a better word. Um, and this map here shows the ancestral clan estates of the seven um, language groups that I work with in Nuka, um, the largest being Ngandi, which is the group that I've been adopted into. Um, so across this area, there were seven traditional languages that were spoken, and most people knew a lot of them. Um, and through the mission sort of process, a lot of the um, language has been lost and often only recorded in um, dictionaries and other kind of documents. Uh, most people speak, well, everybody speaks Creole now, which is a mix of, sort of English and some of the traditional languages. Um, so we're sort of working with eight Aboriginal languages in this area through our work. Uh, the project has been co-developed over the 10 years, as I said, primarily with Cherry Daniels, our leader, our elder, our amazing Order of Australia medal winning um, my grandmother, Cherry Daniels. She's a legend. She's awesome. I wish she could be here, but there's no way she'll ever get on the plane. Um, she, hated, she said she'll come by bus, but nah. <laughs> It's, it's a bit crazy. And we've also developed the project over the years with senior ranger and now acting ranger coordinator, Julie Roy. Um, the Yugamungi Rangers is who, who I first started working with back in 2008. And since then we've sort of expanded to work with the whole community, um, other elders, the school, young people, and into neighbouring communities as well. Um, so the co-developed sort of nature of our project. Um, this is a really important feature of our work, and I guess you've heard other people talking about the sort of typology of citizen science projects, from contributory projects where people collect data for scientists. Um, we've really tried to uh, not do that um, and work together to develop projects that are locally meaningful, involve people from the start to the finish in every aspect of it. Um, so in the design, um, action around the design, collecting data, analysing data, reporting on the data and then redesigning and sort of going around again. And we've also had some offshoot projects that I'll talk about. Um, so over 10 years we started um, with a feral ungulate exclusion fencing project. So when I was a, a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed postdoc um, going out to remote Arnhem Land, um, talking to the rangers and people in the community about what they wanted to do. They're really concerned about feral ungulates, so ungulates being hard-hooved animals. So up in this part of the world, we're dealing with buffalo, pig, horse and donkey. But mainly around um, the billabongs and wetlands, we're primarily concerned with pig and buffalo. Um, wetlands are obviously very important um, as places of fresh water, um, of food. Cherry talks about um, billabongs and fresh water as supermarkets of the past and present and should be future, but unfortunately these hard hoof animals are really making a big mess, as you can see from this middle photo here, it's a bit bright, but um, that's myself, Julie, um, Edna and Rose on the side of Nullawan Billabong that we were talking about fencing. You can see some of the guys in the back getting it ready um, to try and keep the ferals out of this billabong, which is a culturally significant place for um, local people. Um, so that was really sort of the focus of this, the start of all of this work, where it all started in these dirty, muddy, disgusting billabongs, um, talking to the rangers and the community about which billabongs they wanted to fence. This, um, maybe you think it might be quite an easy task. Yep, let's just go fence that. Off we go. Let's get some material. Um, no, it took about six months to decide which ones we were going to fence off. Um, all sorts of reasons, and um, that's one thing I learnt quite early on, that time, blackfellow time, got to take it easy, got to go with the flow, got to let everybody have a good yarn about it, make sure we're all on board, and then we can go ahead. Um, so these were the three billabongs that we chose to fence, Costello, Namaluri, and Nullawan. Um, we fenced off three parts of these billabongs. They were all culturally significant. Um, and then, because I've got a sort of Western scientific background, and one of my sort of directives was to do some, you know, real science. Um, so we had some control sites, the fenced and unfenced control. And over the last 10 years, we've been monitoring inside and outside those fences. Um, yeah. So here's some photos of us in action from 2009 um, to more recently. We've been involving more kids and young people. And over on the right there, that's Nullawan Billabong. Um, yeah, where we've spent a lot of time, um, we've done a whole lot of different monitoring, water quality testing, um, measuring the amount of feral animal damage around the billabongs um, with people. We've done fauna surveys um, and recording traditional owner views of the fences, the billabongs and why it's important to look after them. Um, 
So from that Billabong fencing project, we were obviously out on country a lot um, over that time and talking to elders and the rangers about, okay, so you know, we're starting to develop the relationship, um, develop the projects. They're getting a bit bored of just going to the same old fenced area all the time, so was I, when I was looking at 20,000 square kilometres of remote Australia. Um, we decided, okay, let's, let's expand this out. Um, people um, are really concerned about small mammals and large reptiles in southeast Arnhem Land. Um, Cherry, um, in particular, very sort of emotional about the decline of these species. So she, um, once we'd established our relationship, she's a she asked me to help work with young people to raise awareness about um, the species that we weren't seeing anymore. So we um, started sort of tinkering with these cross-cultural biodiversity surveys, um, taking young people and old people out on country, um, doing a, a mix of surveys using Western scientific techniques and also local Aboriginal techniques. Um, so what that means, so we've done some Western scientific trapping using pitfall traps, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, um, Elliot traps, cage traps, camera traps, all the different types of traps that you know, white fellows have constructed to trap animals. Um, and then we've done it blackfellas style, so just wandering around seeing what we can find, tracking animals, looking for scats, um, talking to elders about stories as well. So it's been a very sort of enriching program um, so far. A lot of people are really excited about it. Um, so you can see a whole range of photos here of um, us in the field doing different things. Um, one of the important things we've been doing over the years is bringing in um, new technologies to record our data. So in uh, sort of recognition of the, the low English numeracy and literacy skills um, of the people I work with, we've developed some cool kind of user-friendly electronic data collection tools to record the animals, um, take photos and geo sort of you know, GPS locations of the species so we can um, keep all of our data and do something with it. So you can see in the top right uh, left-hand corner up here some of the guys with tablets um, where we were initially using CyberTracker software to record um, all of our data and that's been an, in an invaluable tool over the time. I really encourage people to think about using electronic data collection technology because it really you know, makes life a hell of a lot easier um, instead of the old paper and pen and then transferring everything onto the computer. Um, just do it once and then that's it. You can spend time on other stuff, which is cool, like catching, you know, running up trees and catching field net lizards. Um, here's some more cool photos. We've done a whole range of cool um, yeah, on-country trips using helicopters, camping with big mobs, having massive arguments and, you know, big um, camp camping grounds. Um, it's been really fantastic. Um, camping near the beach with school kids, taking... Um, School kids as a reward out on country um, for a week, week long camping trips on, on the side of the on the beach there, as you can see in the top right hand corner. Um, also going into the school. So when we're catching animals, we take the um, animals into the school and talk to the, the kids about um, what we found and names and trying to get them excited about the environment. Um, the third stage of the project. Um, it was just like a sort of natural evolution that we started more formally working um, with young people. Um, I guess over the time, like what, one of the things I was really interested in doing, working with people to you know, better manage country, better understand country. Um, and young people are the decision makers of the future. And I guess I was seeing a big disconnect with the older people, like the rangers and young people. Young people, you know, just sometimes not that interested to get to go out bush. Um, unless they've got their phone and all their mates and stuff like that. So we thought, well, you know, let's just let's work with that and take all the mates and take all the phones and use the phones to collect data and, you know, take music along and make it fun. And that was something that a lot of people have talked about as well. You've got to make citizen science projects fun. You've got to make people want to come along, want to um, be engaged and learn and contribute. So we were really fortunate that the Nature Conservancy and the House of Living Australia um, really supported um, this sort of development of our project, more sort of formally including young people um, in training and um, yeah, getting out on country, working with the elders, working with science and computers and stuff like that. Um, so here's some of the young people that I work with in action. It's unfortunate Melissa Wurramaraba can't be here today. She was going to come, but yeah, she, she couldn't make it. Um, I don't often speak by myself about this stuff. I really like to be speaking with my colleagues so you can get a feel for what, what they think from, from themselves, from their own mouth. 
um, and also get an understanding of the, the cultural sort of um, perspectives and challenges, if you like. Um, nevertheless, here's some photos of um, some of the amazing people that I work with, amazing kids, um, old people, Cherry down there in the bottom two photos, always with us. She's probably the most knowledgeable person in the town um, and she's really passionate about passing on her knowledge to young people, so she's an uh, invaluable resource to the community in our project and that's why she won the Order of Australia medal. Um, uh, as we've sort of gone along and worked with young people, it's been clear that uh, education, you know, is a massive issue in remote Aboriginal Australia. So part of our mandate was to work with young people to sort of raise the level of education and, he and help them sort of retain, um, like attend school, basically. Um, last year, three young people from Nooka started studying at Macquarie University, finally. So the first kids in over 30 years to go to uni <laughs> from this community. So, yeah, so proud of this mob. Don't cry, don't cry. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're awesome. It's massive, um, you know, young people going from a remote community going to uni and, yeah, no one from, since the 80s has been to uni from that community and even then in the 80s it's a bit sort of doubtful um, what that cohort of old people actually did at uni. Um, nevertheless, these guys are doing the, the legit um, yeah, full bachelor's degrees, getting sort of sinking their teeth right into it and really being amazing role models for the community. And all of us. <laughs> yeah, moving along. Okay, so cross-cultural, what does that mean? How do we do this? Um, so basically we're combining Indigenous and Western science to um, explore kind of locally meaningful methods of better understanding and managing country. Um, it's a constant sort of challenge balancing the indigenous and Western science. Um, yeah, so if you read the literature, there's a whole lot of kind of debate about integrating different knowledge systems and, and power sort of balance and imbalance and how, what's the best way to do it. Um, I guess we just kind of try and keep it real and whatever's working at the time, just being conscious of um, the need to balance. So if we're sort of going too much in one way, we sort of go back and look at the other way as well so we can um, address the needs of both and, and keep our funding partners happy and, my, and the boss happy. Um, yeah, but it's really cool and I think they mesh really well, especially in the environmental management and um, you know, biodiversity research. There's amazing, obvious synergies between Western and Indigenous science and our aspirations really to care for the country, you know, just keeping it simple. Um, yep, so that's us in action, just using the different um, tools and techniques, um, Aboriginal and, you know, storytelling, over to getting out all the field guides, and that's a linguist there working with me, um, getting out all the books and dictionaries and resources that we could, the written resources that we have, so, and the resources that we have in the minds of the old people. Um, so now I'll just show you some of the results um, that we've had over the years. I guess we've heard people talk about um, a lot of data being collected, but what are we actually doing with the data? Um, so this is something you know that's really important for all citizen science. We, we must do something with the data and make it, I think, publicly available, especially if it's funded by the public. Um, very important, you know. Uh, I know it's hard. Geez, I work in some very tough situations as well, but we have to, we have to get those messages out there. Um, so some of the results that um, we've been getting over the years with our feral under exclusion fences, um, we've been taking sort of photo points. Um, here's just some examples of, I mean, it's a very obvious um, improvement in um, the condition of the billabongs. So we don't have the turning around the edge of the billabongs that we used to. We've got vegetation um, increasing. Um, lily cover increasing across the billabongs. So we use the, the permanent photo points to show that. I'm also collecting data and I've got a science background so we crunch some numbers and produce some graphs and write some papers um, to show these things. Um, so an increase in vegetation cover when you fence around a billabong um, and a decrease in bare ground. Um, but I guess, you know, it's a pretty obvious kind of result but there's, there's deeper meanings and what we've kind of talked about over the 10 years is that um, in this particular example, we can't just get rid of feral animals from this environment. Um, we need to raise awareness of the impacts of invasive species, but in some contexts it's you know, impossible to remove them and local landholders don't actually want to remove them sometimes, which is the case in South East Arnhem Land. They want buffalo, especially on their country, for potential um, income. 
you know, recognising that this is an impoverished part of Australia, very low employment opportunities, and um, yeah, so people don't want to get rid of them. But nevertheless, they do value these places. The billabongs is um, culturally very cu culturally important, um, as ecologically important, and sort of for recreational and social reasons as well. So we sort of talk about multifunctional landscapes in this context in South East Arnhem Land. So we can't have everything. We're not going to cull all of the ferals, but in some places we can keep them out of places, out of you know billabongs, and other places we're just going to have to let them go. And this is an Indigenous protected area. You know, it's a protected area, part of the National Reserve System. But you know, people have been living on this country, managing country forever. Um, you can't remove people and um, our preferences for that country from the landscape. You know, we have to think logically and kind of realistically about how we can better manage and there's always going to be these trade-offs that we have to be mindful of and be realistic about. Anyway, so that's just a bit of a story about the fencing project. Um, and to complement the science kind of outputs, we've got the indigenous outputs that are very important to us in the community. So I just wanted to show you a little photo of Cherry, my Abidji, my grandmother, um, talking about Nullawan Billabong. บ่นกําเนิดบ่นตุ้มบ่ดิสเพนต์บ่ทําละเยอะสบายสิงบ่สิงบ่ <laughs> <laughs> ตาจันทร์ก็น่าบ่กุลกุลมันก็มันมันก็มันทรูเหี้ยนน่ะมันจันทร์ตาตาแต่มันจริงๆมันยานังน่าละวันกุลเจอเนี่ยตาตาอะ
Um, this is just a map here to show you um, the existing data for the South East Arnhem Land IPA compared to Kakadu. So you can see that the um, sort of the data poor condition that we have there in South East Arnhem Land, but we see it as a real opportunity for us to work together, um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, um, to put some dots on the map and to acknowledge Aboriginal um, collectors and recorders and scientists in that work. Um, to try and sort of remedy some of the issues that we had in the past, where a lot of Aboriginal people did go out with early explorers and help find and name and you know, record things, but they were never acknowledged. So we'd like to um, address that situation. Um, we've done some sort of crunch some numbers to, to show that there's been a lot more species recorded in Kakadu, a lot more um, funding resources put into that area, which is a World Heritage listed national park, as most people probably know. Um, nevertheless, it's very similar to South East Arnhem Land, similar kind of habitats, ecosystems and species. So we'd expect about a comparable um, numbers of species. So we've got a bit of work to do, which is the opportunity that we've kind of created for ourselves is to fill that space. We've found some oh, new populations of threatened species, our famous little Leichhardt's grasshopper population that we found, which is very cool. Everyone got very excited about that. Um, not just the scientists, but the community were extremely excited, probably more so excited. Um, Benjamin um, Wilfred, he was probably the most excited out of everybody, went home with a pocket full of Leichhardt's grasshoppers for the family, which I... <laughs> Um, didn't know at the time that we were in the troopy on the way home, and I'm like, what the hell, where's all these grasshoppers coming from? And he's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm taking some home for the kids to show them because I've never seen them before. So I was like, yeah, no, that's cool. That's what it's all about, you know, <laughs> sharing the knowledge and, yeah. Um, when we spoke to Cherry about the grasshopper at first, she, she knew that it had existed. She'd heard stories about it, but she hadn't seen it for a very long time. Um, it took her, like, I think it was a couple of years before she started to tell me about the, the Nandi story and how the, the real significance of it to the old people, but she was still kind of, you know, scratching the depths of her brain, trying to, trying to think about um, what old people would have thought about it in the past. So we're still sort of working on that one. There's a lot of examples like that. Um, scientific output. So we think we found a couple of new species as well, Marethia, that we're working with people from the South Australian Museum to describe and some to notice. So we work with Craig Moritz at ANU as well um, to record some of the, the skinks and, hope, and it looks like we've got a couple of new species there, which is pretty cool. Um, the cultural outputs are extremely important, uh, as I've said, and you, you're now starting to understand. Um, intergenerational knowledge transfer is yeah, extremely important for the elders in the community. Um, you know, the knowledge that they have in their minds is like is libraries, you know, um, hundreds, thousands, thousands, millions, who knows, of years of knowledge kind of accumulated in their minds and at really extreme, you know, risk of being lost forever. So it's extremely important. Um, these are endangered languages, critically endangered languages, critically endangered um, knowledge that we really need to be mindful of maintaining and protecting just as we do species, critically endangered species. So we're seeing a little bit of progress um, in support of maintaining these critically endangered languages and knowledge, but yeah, not, <laughs> not enough by any, any shot. We need to put a lot more effort into that. So hopefully through some of this work we can start to raise awareness of that real need. Um, and get a better understanding of the threats to that knowledge and culture, as well as the threats to the species and the places that we're concerned about as well. So I'll just show you a little photo of um, Jerry Ashley here talking about double on this um, little Varanus little monitor here, which is really cute. Don't have subtitles, so hopefully it's not too loud. You can hear what he's saying. Well, Finneback country, they can go under the stone. Because did they stones go in They're under the little stone. And the horror look, eh? The tree, they get horror look. We we'll cut it, we we'll look the smooth ground, the really smooth one. My old, my grandmother used to tell me, hey, hold it, don't go, get it, tell me, okay, look, you know, smooth one, you want it in there, double one, yeah? So I'm cutting the tree, I'm about to double one. Yeah, good one. Taste, taste this one like, like a chicken, the tail butt. Tastes like, like a chicken. Like a chicken, really smooth and soft one. Yeah. And they eat, you know, smash it, the tail, smash it, make it. They're, they're chewing, like a chewing, no? like a chewing gum, eh? The tail part. Chicken chewing gum. Oh, people gum. Now, I'll them <laughs> yeah, he's a classic. He's a good bloke. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so we've got a whole range of local benefits um, that are starting to accrue through the project. Um, that building and learning about scientific and indigenous knowledge, people starting to get really excited about it and build their confidence around it. Like confidence, you know, is the biggest one of the biggest challenges that we've had over the years. Um, in Aboriginal people that I work with, just not feeling confident and not speak, wanting to speak out about what they know or don't know. So, sort of trying to break that down and just, you know, just create a safe space for people to learn and share knowledge. Uh, we're employing tons of people these days, um, young people, old people, men, women, um, to get involved and take them out on country and start to reconnect. Um, we're empowering young people um, at the same time. So you can see Nina here getting pretty excited about getting behind the wheel of my troopy, um, which has had two new engines since we started. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and some of the boys, which has been really cool to work with some of them as well. Uh, we've been to a number of conferences presenting together. Um, as I said, that's what I usually like to do. Uh, so this is when we had a big mob of the Young Bulla project. We call it the Young, Pe the Young Bulla project. That's the Young People's Project. Um, we had a, um, the Native Title Conference in Darwin, so that was an opportunity to, for us to get a whole big mob of the young people up there, and they all said something. It was, you know, it was a fantastic experience for all of them, even though there's some grumpy-looking faces there. They all had a pretty good time. Um, <laughs> Maybe, yeah, not like in the photo or too hot or something, I don't know. Um, young people. And then we, uh, last year we went to the ENCRA Symposium with the ALA, which was a, a privilege for us to go down and talk about um, how we we're combining Indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge in that sort of national forum as well. Um, local benefits. Um, we really work hard to inform local decision making and um, land management in South East Island IPA. So, We've contributed to the um, South East Island IPA Plan of Management. Um, we do a whole lot of kind of community um, booklets and leaflets and post them around town. Um, more recently, we've um, started to pull a lot of our biodiversity, cross-cultural biodiversity knowledge, and produced um, a local plant and animal guide, uh, which has got 10 different languages in it, all the languages of the area. Um, cultural knowledge, whatever we could gather for each of the um, 275 species that feature in the book. So that's quite an achievement, and that's just a local publication at the moment. But um, yeah, we'll see how we go with intellectual property sort of sharing and the community um, decisions slash arguments about that over the next um, year. <laughs> that should be right. Okay, national benefits. So. Um, as I've said, we're building baseline biodiversity data for remote areas, creating um, a, building a better understanding of remote environmental assets and threats, enhancing the management of these remote areas of Australia, supporting Indigenous community development. Um, this is something I was really pleased to see um, people talk about, Karen and others. Um, that citizen science, you know, it's not just about um, science, but the sort of synergies between um, environmental and social justice and community empowerment that's taking place through a lot of citizen science is, is really encouraging, and it's just fantastic to see other people, people around the world, um, getting into this space. Um, we're really starting to show how Indigenous and non-Indigenous people can work together for real benefits. Um, and raising awareness of Aboriginal people working on country. So that's one of the things that I like to do is advocate for you know, more support um, of Aboriginal Ra the Aboriginal Ranger program, for example. Um, carrying on with the outputs, as I said, is always important. So we've um, published a range of papers with different um, collaborators about our work, um, the sort of local benefits, but also how we can work together and link into policy um, and into science. Uh, we communicate through other channels, through the Atlas of Living Australia, through the blogs, which is very cool. We love the Atlas and so glad to see the support continuing and hope it carries on. Um, conferences, lectures, I've written in the conversation a few times about our stuff. We've got a YouTube channel, um, which the young people are putting together videos that they've made themselves. So they're very DIY, but they're pretty cute, pretty cool. Um, I can show you if you want later. Um, we've been in the media a little bit and we like to get involved in National Science Week and the Indigenous Science event, um, try and bring young people down from Arnhem Land to share their knowledge about bush medicines and bush tucker and stuff. Um, local outputs are obviously extremely important as well. We've got the Nooka Festival that we present our work at, school workshops, local meetings um, and in the little Nooka News we've featured our work a few times as well. Um, 
And like most projects, collaborations are um, extremely important to us and keep us sort of grounded and networked um, with other groups and people that are working in similar space. So the Atlas has been, as I said, really crucial um, to our to, oh, the development of our project. Um, we're doing some pretty cool things um, with them at the moment. We should have a group of six young Aboriginal women working right now on this. I hope so. They're usually ringing me by now, but uh, they should be building um, our online pro species profile pages. So I said we've made our book of 275 species. So what we'd like to do, what we're working on now, is transferring that to an online version. Uh, that's all private at the moment, so I don't want to um, show you any of that here. I don't have permission, but. Um, yeah, that's a really cool thing to, to build young people's um, computer literacy and we'll take that into the school and get the, the kids engaged in that as well. And that's in the 10 languages um, too, so that's pretty cool. Um, we're entering all, some of our sightings of um, plants and animals into the ALA, which is another good process for the young people's engagement. Um, other collaborators are the sort of neighbours the Lanapoi Indigenous Protected Area, the Uralka Ranges and the Numbawa Numbrini Ranges. We're starting to work more with them and share our experiences, which is also really exciting. Um, we've got the kids coming down to Macquarie Uni and other um, elders and people to share their knowledge, and that's a really empowering um, part of our project as well, is, and building you know, uh, Aboriginal people's confidence to share their knowledge. And um, <clears throat> like the gentleman was saying before, we, we often get really scared about sharing knowledge and for Indigenous intellectual property rights, definitely we have to be worried about that. But at the same time, I think people just could too quickly put the barrier up. Um, but most of the Aboriginal people I work with, they want to share their knowledge. They want people to know what they know um, and what they've got to share and to be valued. So um, I try and facilitate them coming down uh, so they can do that. Um, I just wanted to point out some of the drivers of success that have, have allowed us to, to work together. I often get a lot of people asking me, you know, how do you do this? How do you work with a mob? You know, it's so challenging. I've approached the land council and they say, oh, talk to this person, talk to that person, or come back next week. Oh, no, I'm too busy, too tired. You know, there's, there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's this <clears throat> um, yeah, pretty powerful legacy of colonisation that we have to deal with. Um, that's you know, very challenging and confronting and can be difficult for people when we don't have a lot of time, a lot of money to kind of overcome those challenges. Um, nevertheless, hopefully our persistence and commitment will inspire you guys to get involved. Um, you know, some of the th key things I think that have made us successful is just the relationship building, start small, you know, build solid relationships, um, support people in what they want to do. And the project co-development was absolutely essential to, to this project, um, building trust, being allowed to make mistakes, you know, I make mistakes, they make mistakes, not growling at people, not punishing people, but just, you know, acknowledging that. Um, time, giving yourself, everybody time and having a long-term vision for the partnership. Money, of course, don't need to go on about that too much, it's important. But um, constant refinement and um, reflection on the project has been really important, and especially for me, coming from a scientific background. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, better ways of doing things and putting the science aside sometimes, even though know, I've got, you know, my old professor saying, no, Em, you can't do that, you can't do that, you know, it's not scientifically, statistically robust, don't be silly, you know, you can't. You know, sometimes you've got to leave that aside um, and just go with what local people want if you want to have real impact. Um, so we do applied research that's culturally meaningful, um, produce tangible outputs that people can see, feel and um, touch and connect with. And we really try and link with policy and government objectives as well, because we know we all have to work together to, to change the situation. Um, so we're working with seven uh, plus language groups, and there's over 250 out there. Um, so there's a lot more opportunity for us to work together, a lot more work to do. So I encourage you to get into it. Um, we've had a lot of fun over the time, and big thanks to all of our funding partners and friends and collaborators. Thanks for coming along. <laughs>